about this crucial, crucial subject. The word unity is spelled U-N-I-T-Y. And to those that have been paying attention and following along, you've noticed that each week we've been emphasizing one of those letters in this subject. Uh, when we looked at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, we talked about the U in unity, which was the urgency. What do we want? Unity. When do we want it? Now. This is what Jesus prayed for. This is what he petitioned the Father for. And this happens to be the theme of the fourth chapter of this prison epistle. The following week, we went and talked about the N in unity, looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, which are the non-negotiables of unity. We see that there are seven ones in that text. There is but one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. If we are going to ever have unity, we cannot compromise the seven tenets of the Christian's faith. And then we went to the I in unity, which is the improvements to maintain unity. This is not to suggest that we can improve or make better the plan of God, but what it does mean is that if we have fallen short of meeting the biblical demand for unity, then verses seven through 16, provides a plan that we must follow to improve our own standing to get us to where God would have us to be. Last week, we talked about the T in unity, looking at verses 17 through 24, which is the truth to inspire unity. That simply means that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And one of the reasons why unity does not exist in the body of Christ as it should is because some of the older saints forgot that they used to be newer saints and they have forgotten the baggage that they brought to the cross of Christ. And if we can remember from whence we came and, re and thank God that we're not what we used to be, but we are definitely not what we ought to be, then we can have a better attitude in dealing with one another to be able to come together and be all that Jesus called and died for us to be. And so we're going to conclude this series by dealing with the why in unity. And so I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject the yearning for unity, the yearning for unity. And that is going to come from Ephesians chapter four, verses 25 through 32. Now I want us to do something this morning. I want us all to imagine being imprisoned because of your faith. Now, while in prison, you begin to reflect on your journey, what brought you to this point. You were given a gift that guaranteed your freedom and protection throughout your lifetime in the form of Roman citizenship in the first century. Your parents, who loved you very much, made faith and education a priority by raising you according to the law of Moses and sending you off to study and learn at the feet of one of the three great rabbis of that time, and that name of that rabbi was Gamaliel. You were taught to take pride in your heritage and position, for after all, you are a Benjaminite. You are, the, you are a descendant of Israel's youngest and beloved son and a tribe who remained faithful to the Davidic dynasty, a tribe who produced Israel's first united king and favor would have it that you would adorn his name. Your zeal for, for the God of your father has caused you to commit to a life of studying, teaching, 
and ruling God's people as a Pharisee. Understanding the damage heresy has caused and could further cause God's people, you make it your personal crusade to eradicate any doctrine or eliminate any person who does not subscribe to your brand of Neo-Judaism. It never crosses your mind that the path you have chosen is wrong because you have thought every thought, done every deed, and spoken every word in a good conscience. Then one day, as you are traveling to do what you believe to be God's work, you are confronted by the God of the Son of God Himself, and you stand accused of running counter to His mission. The Lord, who is the giver of sight, removes it from you to prohibit you from doing any more harm. Then He gives you instructions to go and wait. Now, while you wait, you fast and pray for three days with the understanding that you yourself are lost. Finally, a man, a preacher of the gospel by the name of Ananias arrives and he says the following words to you. He says, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. We see these words in Acts chapter 9, verse 17, as well as Acts chapter 22, verses 14 through 16. And as a result of hearing those words and obeying the commands that were given to you at that moment, your sight is back, your faith has changed, and your zeal renewed. And from this day forth, you cannot help yourself. All you know is and preach is Christ and him crucified. It has not been an easy road, but no one can make you doubt him because you know too much about him. See, you have been lied on, talked about, plotted against, and doubted. And as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, or rather, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, yes, verses 24 through 30. Five times you received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times you were beaten with rods. Once you were stoned. Four times you were shipwrecked. A night and a day you were adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from your own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on you of your anxiety for all the churches. After all this, you now find yourself in jail. And the one thing on your mind is not your condition. It's not your decision. It's not even the injustice of your situation or even your impending trial. The one thing that's on your mind after all of this is God's purpose in Christ demonstrated in the unity of God's people. What I've done this morning is acts that we imagine being the Apostle Paul at this point 
in history so we can truly understand how important unity is. After all, unity, as we have stated throughout the weeks, is God's plan. Unity is Christ's prayer. Unity is the Spirit's plea. Unity was even Paul's passion. Hear his words to the church in Corinth. Listen to your Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, the Bible reads, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you but that you be united, how? In the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Therefore, unity, my brothers and sisters, is supposed to be our practice. Unity must be what we yearn for. Like the Apostle Paul, we must have an earnest or strong desire for this thing called unity. As the people of God, we long for oneness. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, there are seven non-negotiables for unity. And as we talk about this lesson this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32, we see seven behaviors of the soul that yearns for unity. So our first point is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, the Bible reads, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. The first behavior that a soul must have that yearns for unity is that we must speak truth. We must speak truth. Listen to your Bible. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, the Bible reads, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Brethren, no more lies, no more pretense. Tell the truth at all times. See, in the body of Christ, we are all connected to one another, as the text says. Do we not know that when we lie to others, we end up lying to ourselves to the extent that God will send a strong delusion that we believe the lie. What we have to understand about lying is that lies sow discord. But there's something about truth. If lies sow discord, truth breeds unity. That's why we must speak truth. But not only that, we come to the second behavior, which is found in verse 26 and 27, where the Bible reads, be angry, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Not only must we speak truth, but the second thing is that we must sin not. Sin not. Listen to your Bible as we go back to the Old Testament and take a look at Psalm 37. And the verses are 8 and 9. In Psalm 37, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says the following. The psalmist says, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself 
Why? It tends only to evil. For the evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Let's also move to the New Testament and take a look at James chapter 4 and the verse is 7. In James chapter 4, and the verse is seven, a very familiar passage of scripture. The book says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. And if we resist the devil and submit to God, the book says the devil will flee from you. What we must understand on this morning is that it is okay to get angry. For all anger is not sinful. See, we are commanded not to use our anger as fuel for revenge. Therefore, once we get angry, we are commanded not to stay angry. We are commanded not to give Satan that kind of foothold in our lives. Because sin separates, but submission to God is one of those things that leads to unity. But not only must we sin not and speak truth, the third behavior that we must have if we truly yearn for unity is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. In Ephesians chapter 4 and the verse is 28, the book reads, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So the third behavior we must have if we truly yearn for unity is that we must work honestly. We must work honestly. Listen to your Bible. In Galatians chapter 6 and the verses 10, in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 10, the Bible reads, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. As we go a little further in these epistles of Paul, we come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and the verses are 11 and 12. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Verse 11 and 12, the apostle writes, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Then we come back to the Old Testament, to the words of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 21, verses 25 through 26. When we take a look at Proverbs chapter 21, verses 25 through 26, the Bible reads, the desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor all day long, he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. My brothers and sisters, what we must understand from this text is that stealing creates enemies, but labor discourages laziness. And when we give from our labor, it's this very act that encourages unity. Which brings us to the fourth behavior, which is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. In verse 29, the Bible reads, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Yes, we must speak truth. Yes, we must sin not. Yes, we must work honestly. But the fourth thing we must do is get into the habit of edifying one another. The text tells us that we must build one another up and we must do it with our words. Listen to your Bible. In Ephesians chapter 5, in the verses 4, 
Ephesians chapter 5 and the verse is 4. The Bible reads, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Brethren, let us watch the way we talk to one another. Let nothing inappropriate come from our mouths. Let us only speak that which helps. Let us learn to think before we speak. Think is an acronym for us to ask these five questions. I know I've said it before, but I don't mind being redundant. The T in think is true. So we need to ask the question, is it true? The H in think is helpful. Is it helpful? The I in think is inspiring. Is it inspiring? The M in think is necessary. Is it necessary? The K in think is kind. Is it kind? Because if it's not kind, if it's not necessary, if it's not inspiring, if it's not helpful, and if it's not true, then it's not edifying, and it shouldn't come from our mouths. See, my brothers and sisters, we not only need to edify one another with our words, but the fifth behavior is found in verse 30 of the same text. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the fifth behavior is for us to not only sin not, but to grieve not the Holy Spirit. Listen to your Bible. In Isaiah chapter 63 and the verses 10, Isaiah 63 and the verses 10, the Bible reads, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. I don't care how long you've had your membership at Gold Gym or or LA Fitness. I don't care how many degrees you have, that you may have more degrees than a thermometer. If you make an enemy of the Holy Spirit of God, that is a fight you will never win. And so we are commanded, in order for us to have unity, that we need to make sure we grieve not the Holy Spirit. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, another familiar passage of Scripture. The book says, do not quench the Spirit. See, my brothers and sisters, division reigns when we are discontented with God's way of doing things. See, when we learn to simply let go and let God have his way in our lives, then unity will be the inevitable result. See, the reason why unity doesn't exist is because we get in God's way of progress. And so we have to learn that in life, either we are on the way or we are in the way. And so if we are in the way, we need to get on our way by getting out of the way and going on our way, walking with the one who has a heaven and a hell to put us in, and that is Jesus Christ. The sixth behavior we must have for unity is found in verse 31. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, the book says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And so the sixth behavior we must have is that we must learn to put away evil. And not just evil, we must learn to put away all evil. Listen to your Bible. In Colossians chapter 3 and the verses 8, Colossians chapter 3 and the verses 8, the Bible reads, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. See, as Christians, we need to make a clean break with all manners and appearances of evil. Those who are lost need to see something different in us that, than what they have experienced in the world. 
My brothers and sisters, people are yearning for answers. And only becoming one with Christ can satisfy this hunger. And so, yes, we have to put away evil. We have to grieve not the spirit. We have to edify one another. We have to work honestly. We have to sin not. We have to speak truth. But the seventh and final behavior is found in verse 32, where the Bible reads, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This seventh behavior is that we need to be good to all. We need to be good to all. Listen to your Bible. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, the Bible reads, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. As Christians, we must learn to turn the negative, destructive attitudes that are found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 into gracious responses which are beneficial to the spiritual development of all men. Again, unity is maintained when we are helpful, when we are courteous, when we are polite, and when we are hospitable. So where do you stand this morning? It has not escaped my thought, but I recognize that this is the last Sunday of this year. This is the last Sunday of this year. And if God sees fit that we see tomorrow, Monday is going to be the last Monday of this year. And if we are blessed to see Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we're going to have experienced the last week of this year. I encourage you not to wait until January 1st to make resolutions that you're going to be a better Christian or a better person going into 2023. Make that decision today because this afternoon is not promised. Tomorrow not promised. Next year isn't promised. There's only one date on God's calendar and that date is now. The question is, do you have that earnest desire and craving and yearning to want to be all that Jesus died for you to be and all that God has called you to be. You've heard God's word on today. You've heard it in song. You've heard it in the reading of his word. You've heard it in the proclamation that is found in his inspiration this very morning. You've heard how Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins that you may have a right to eternal life. You've heard that he has given you permission through his call for you to come to him, according to John chapter 6, verse 45. All you have to do is believe that he is who he says he is. Just believe that God loved you so much that Jesus came from glory to die as a sacrifice for your transgression. And that if you believe in him, you shouldn't perish, but you should have everlasting life. But that everlasting life is conditioned to you acting on what you believe, and that's called faith. 
If you have faith, you will repent as Jesus taught us in Luke 13, 3. If you have faith, you will confess him to be the son of the living God as Jesus taught us in Matthew 10, 32. If you have faith, Faith, you will not fight and debate your need to be baptized. You will meet the blood of Jesus and submit to water baptism this day and have your sins washed away as Jesus taught us in Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And once you have done what God has commanded you to do by faith, God keeps every last one of his promises. He will forgive you of your sins, according to Acts 2.38. He will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Well, what kind of creature is that? A creature that will, from this day forward, speak truth, sin not, Work honestly, edify others, grieve not the spirit, put away evil, and do good to everybody. And when you have made that resolve to be a child of the king, a child of God, God will add you. You don't have to find, you don't have to look, you don't have to search, because God himself will add you to his church the only church you can read about in Scripture, and that church is the Church of Christ. The prophets told us that this church was coming in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Jesus came and said he was going to build it in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus wouldn't even let death keep him in the ground, rose from the grave and built that church in Acts chapter 2 purchased that church with his very own blood, the blood that he shed on Calvary in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and he adds to save to it according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and that church bears his name and the name of no other according to Romans chapter 16, verse 16. So why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord? There's a lot of people today celebrating the fact that he came the first time. And I'm here to tell you that if he came the first time, and when he came the first time, told us that he's going to leave and come back a second time, you need to prepare yourself for the second coming of Jesus. And the way you do that is through obedience to the gospel and righteous living. Paul said before he died in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, but not for me only, but for all them that love his appearing. Maybe you're a Christian already. Have you been exhibiting? the behaviors of one that longs for unity. If you've been speaking lies, this is your opportunity to make it right with God. If you've been presumptuously sinning, then this is your opportunity to make that right with God this morning. If you have been working but haven't been working honestly or you've been busy but not busy at work but a busy body, meaning that you saying things you ought not be saying, going places where you ought not be going, doing things that you ought not be doing, thinking things that you ought not be thinking and turning innocent minds of people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, then this is your opportunity to make that right with God this very day. Have you been not building people up, but tearing people down with your words? Then this is your time, your moment to make that right with God. Have you become an enemy of the Holy Ghost? You need to come forward, repent of your sins, acknowledge your wrong, pray for forgiveness, and get back on the winning team. Have you Put away evil. If so, good for you. 
But have you been like Saul and said, well, I'm going to put away some evil, but hold on to some other evil. You have to put away all evil. One of the things that the Bible commands us and teaches us through many direct commands and statements are all the things that we should be doing and all the things that we should be staying away from. But even if God's word has not shared with us the things that we need to avoid doing and the things we ought to be doing, the obvious thing that should convict us is looking at how people act in the world and say, I'm going to do the complete opposite. But the reason why people don't come to Christ is because they see people in the world acting a fool and then they say, well, I'm going to come to Christ and they see Christians still acting a fool as if they are still in the world. And so what's my motivation to come to the church if people in the church are acting like people in the world? We're supposed to be separate. If people are lying out there, we're supposed to be speaking the truth in here. If people are fornicating out there, we're supposed to be living pure and holy and consecrated lives in here. If people are clubbing out there, we're supposed to be churching in here. There has to be a definitive difference between the people in the world and the people in the kingdom. We are in the kingdom of light. They are in the kingdom of darkness. And we have to live our lives in such a way that the people in the darkness can see the light that shines from our soul and see the glorious Savior whose light shine upon us to realize that they have been blind all this time and they need to come to Christ so they can finally see. So if you haven't put away all evil, then this is your opportunity to let it all go this morning. Have you been good? Or have you only been good to people you like? See, because we're supposed to be good to all. We're supposed to follow the example of Jesus. Jesus didn't die for us and pay the penalty for our sins because we had it all together or because we were so good or because we were so great or because we were so righteous or because he actually believed what we said we would do. No, no, no. He did that while we were yet sinners. He did that while we were ungodly. He did that before we even pledged allegiance to him. And so if he has been that good to us and God who has still been good to us by allowing us to wake up every morning, because if the truth be told, the only reason why we're in this place this morning is because a divine was decision was made while we slept not to check the record. Because if God was to actually check our record and know how we have shamed him and hurt him and injured him and broke his heart, none of us would be here this morning. But because he's good, he woke us up, giving us an opportunity to make right our wrongs so we can be better today than we were on yesterday. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his forgiveness. Thank God for his greatness. Honor him by being good to everybody. So that people can say, why are you being good to me? Because I need for you to see my father in the deeds that I do. That you can come out of this wretched mess of sin and get your right life right with him before it's eternally and everlasting too late. As we sing this song that we're about to sing, understand. That is during moments like this, the sermon preached, the word read, and the songs that we sing, that Jesus is calling us. Don't ignore that call. Because every invitation we ignore will be brought up in the judgment as a reason why we are without excuse when we stand before him. 